This video is about working with 3D depth data from a modern depth sensor. Ultimately, we want to use the data for user input. So first we need to understand and visualize the nature of the data. Next, we extract some meaningful information from it. Then we make effective use of it within applications. Finally, we look at related depth sensing technologies. There are many ways to interact with a computer, but this is typically done with direct physical contact or manipulation of electronic devices connected to the system. With cameras and depth sensors, computers can track anything that's in front of them. Therefore, anything can become an input source. The user, a hand, facial expressions, or even just ordinary objects. So here is the data coming from the depth sensor. Darker blue pixels are further away, lighter pixels are closer. Stuff in the far distance such as the background, is just black. Here we are just viewing the data as a 2D image. This viewer was programmed in OpenGL, so it's easy to adjust the viewing matrix. So now as I hit some keys, I can change the angle at which we view the points. Now clearly this adds no value if we are simply drawing 2D data. Clearly, this 2D view is fairly limiting. It's much better to view the 3D data as a point cloud. So how do we do that? Let's move our data back into 3D space. Think of how the data was initially captured. The camera was placed in front of a scene that captured distances between it and things within its view volume. So there's the 3D space shown below and its view volume in front. Now consider a point at i, j on the depth image. The i, j represents a direction or ray coming out from the camera. Now if we travel along this ray a distance corresponding to the value of the pixel, indi that, that indicates a surface that was seen by the camera. Consequently, this gives you the location of a point in 3D space where something is known to be. Now let's use this new position formula to view the depth data. Making the viewer plot points in 3D only requires a single line code change. So here's the modified viewer. Now at first it looks the same until we start changing the view matrix of the program and then things start to look different. The fixed placement of the depth camera in the real world still affects what can be seen as well as the resolution, or density of samples, for things in the scene. But by rotating around the point cloud, we now can correctly view this geometry from different perspectives, almost as if we had moved the real camera. This 3D point cloud is the ideal way to view and think about the data that comes from a depth camera. Thousands of depth samples is a whole lot of data for a programmer to digest. An application needs to turn this into some meaningful information in order to do something useful with it. Well. In the past, how have we dealt with input devices such as the mouse? Well, there the operating system takes the raw signals and translates them into a simple XY pointer location on the screen. Okay, using the depth data, we could grab the closest pixel and use that as the XY for the pointer. Sure, but it would be nice to capture more than just yet another 2D input stream. One of the useful things we can do is 6D tracking of a simple object or open hand which will give us a 3D position and orientation to work with. An easy and robust 6D tracking system that gives you sub-millimeter accuracy without jitter can be implemented by finding the center of mass and sorted principal axes of the portion of the point cloud you wish to track. For this example we will segment our data by just taking the depth samples that are within a fixed short distance from the camera. To determine the position of the object you are tracking, you simply compute the center of mass of the point cloud. To understand how this works, first consider a 2D example. You take the average of all the x values, then the average of all the y values, and these two averages are the 2D coordinates of the center of mass. In 3D it's also this simple. Simply compute the x average, then the y average, and then the z average. Now you have the center of mass, or 3D position, of your object. 
If you aren't already familiar with linear algebra, it might be helpful to study the basics of 3D vectors and matrices. It also helps to build, or become familiar with, a good 3D library when working in 3D. Tracking the orientation of our simple object is a bit more involved. What we do is find the principal axes of the distribution of our depth points. In 3D, we consider the points relative to the center of mass. Then we compute the covariance of this distribution, which gives us a 3 by 3 symmetric matrix. Therefore, the eigenvectors of the covariance form an orthonormal basis, or rotation matrix, that will diagonalize this matrix. Using the eigenvalues, we can sort the basis vectors to provide a consistent orientation based on the point cloud distribution. To implement this, there are some vector math routines that will come in handy. I'm sure you already know the dot product, which can be thought of as a row vector times a column vector, resulting in a scalar. If you multiply a column vector by a row vector, well, the rules of matrix multiplication give you a 3 by 3 matrix. This is the outer product, and it's useful when computing covariance. The covariance of our points is what describes the distribution. To compute this, we take the summation of the outer product of each point, relative to the center of mass, with itself. This should look familiar to anyone who has studied statistics. From the equation, clearly we have a symmetric matrix. The most common method of diagonalizing a symmetric matrix is the iterative technique described by Jacobi a couple hundred years ago. At each step, you find a rotation that will annihilate the largest non-diagonal entry. One of the most common implementations you'll, that you'll see being used originates from the book Numerical Recipes in C. Since we are working in 3D, rather than using a matrix-based implementation, I wrote a version that just directly accumulates into a quaternion. As mentioned earlier, there will be a handful of possible rotations that produce a diagonal matrix, so we pick the one that will give us a consistent ordering for the magnitudes of the diagonal entries. Let's now apply these tracking methods to the point cloud coming from the depth camera. If we draw a box at the computed center of mass, we see that we do a reasonable job of tracking the single hand moving in the field of view of the camera. We now use the calculated principal axes, or rotation used to diagonalize the covariance, to orient our box. Notice that the box's short, medium, and long axes correspond to the distribution of the points, thus following the hand nicely. Note that the tracking may not capture the true center of mass of whatever object, or visible part of the object, that we get our point cloud from. Nor, depending on the hand pose, will it necessarily point in exactly the same direction as the wrist and hand. It does, however, give us a consistent result with no jittering from frame to frame. Remember, the simple tracker does not distinguish multiple objects and simply uses all points as input. Even with such interference, the results remain quite predictable. Instead of just 2D mouse or touch input, we now have stable fine-grained 6D tracking ready to be used as input to an application. Let's now take a look at a paddle and bouncing ball application that makes use of the depth data and our simple 6D tracking system. The paddle is controlled directly by the user and the ball can be affected by the paddle. We have to deal with collisions between these objects that both move freely in three dimensions. Notice the velocity or motion paths of each object. If we implement our frame update by first setting the paddle to the new user position and then check the path of the moving ball, we might not detect the collision that should happen. Alternatively, if we update the ball position first, it may still end up tunneling through the paddle. It still doesn't work. You can't update these objects separately. Watch the upper left to see the actual simultaneous motion. Clearly, the ball should collide with the paddle. How do we implement the interaction? Since the paddle isn't affected by the ball, we can implement the collision detection response by solving for the ball in the moving reference frame of the paddle. Take the ball's path or velocity vector minus the velocity of the paddle gives the ball relative velocity. If a collision occurs, reflect the velocity vector about the plane of impact. Now you have the path of the ball as it bounces off the paddle. Remember, we're still in the paddle's coordinate frame, so add the paddle's displacement back to the path. This gives you the new world space velocity as well as the collision point and actual path of the ball. 
All right, so here's our game. Hmm, it's a little hard to tell what's going on here. I think we need to draw some walls or something. That's better, but it's still hard to judge distances with the ball. We need a shadow or something. It feels like there's something missing. There's no tactile feedback. It's even hard to tell when the ball hits the paddle. We need to compensate for this with some audio or visual feedback. So now we briefly increase the opacity of the paddle whenever it comes in contact with the ball. This gives the player some notification that he got it. So now I'm getting into this, but when I reach way to the side to get to the ball, everything just stops working. This is because the hand is traveling outside the camera's field of view, thus ruining the user experience. To deal with this problem, we first need to detect when the user is reaching the limits of the field of view. This can be computed in 2D image space to see if all the close pixels are way off to one side. Or, since you've already computed a center of mass, you can divide the x component by the z component to get the tangent of the angle from the center line. Now, when we detect the hand reaching toward the side, we start moving the player sideways in that direction within the game environment. Because he will be focused on hitting the ball, this will naturally encourage him to move his hand back toward the middle of the depth camera's field of view. In other words, we've solved the range issue using a navigation technique. In general, an application must keep the user's intended actions focused front and center. While it may be straightforward to add depth data-based input to control an application, that doesn't guarantee a good user experience. We just worked through a number of design issues that arose in perhaps the simplest game imaginable. In each case, providing good feedback is crucial. Just as 3D sensor hardware and techniques are relatively new, the how-to manual for application developers hasn't been written yet. Incorporating depth data into an interface will certainly require the exploration of new interaction techniques. This may lead to disruptive new user experiences that have a lasting impact on how we do personal computing. While we made decent progress with our simple 6D tracking system, there is lots more that can be done. In general, it would help to identify the things the camera is actually seeing, and continually track the completed updated state or pose of them. Applications could certainly take advantage of the extra information. Implementing these systems would be a lot of work and require a lot of know-how. At this point, it's better to start tapping into existing resources. You should first check for what features are bundled with any SDK that supports your depth camera. You might find well-supported routines that give you exactly what you want. If you haven't already, look at all the existing research from 2D image processing and computer vision. There are lots of books and websites devoted to the subject. Also, because depth data adds a third dimension to the camera input, it is very useful to exploit techniques developed by the graphics and gaming industries over the past two decades. This is not just for application development, but also to analyze the depth data. If our depth camera was following a box of known dimensions, then instead of fitting the center of mass of an unknown shape to the point cloud, we would fit the surface of a similar sized virtual box to the points. This provides a very precise pose of the object. The implementation is physically based. You can think of the depth points as a whole bunch of tiny magnets attracting the box. Some objects consist of multiple parts. For example, the hand has a number of bones. Here we see the full 3D tracking of a hand by fitting a virtual hand model to the point cloud. Given the skeleton pose, we can re-render the hand model from alternative points of view. With the additional degrees of freedom, it can be more prone to error than the simple 6D tracking, so use it when needed. While the simple tracking was sufficient for the paddle game, the full fidelity of the hand tracking enables different kinds of experiences, such as this Jenga game being shown here. I hope you found some value from this introductory video about working with depth data. This is still a new application area with much yet to be discovered and perhaps the opportunity to create some exciting new interactive experiences.